Hi guys, it is another hot, sticky day here in the end times in mid-October, Tuesday, October 13th, 2015. So Tuesday is the day that I bring you my conspiracy wacko rant where I normally try to go on the pages of the mainstream media to bring you some example of those whack job conspiracy theorists, but Today I'm actually going to play it straight, believe it or not, uh, because every once in a while I really do get sent something by an alert tribes member. This one coming from One Meatball uh, sent me this article, which you better believe is not from the mainstream media, which means it's not making fun of conspiracy theorists. This is actually from a website called Dissident Voice, a radical newsletter in the struggle for peace and social justice. So this is where you have to go to look for some real, honest reporting about how the world works. <coughs> so you don't have to go reading between the lines. Now, the reason I'm making this my Tuesday rant is because you kind of do have to read a little bit between the lines on this article. Because uh, what it is, is probably one of the single best, is the word primer or primer. Uh, on the, and, and be careful if there's, if there's any anti-conspiracy theorists lurking in the background. If you are a conspiracy factist, we need to be careful of these words, which is why you never see these words. You'll never see the words conspiracy theory in, in here. You will never see the word New World Order, Illuminati, and out of 75 footnotes, you will never see the name Alex Jones or David Icke. What this story titled why the deep state always wins the zero-sum game of perpetual war by a fellow I'd never heard of, an excellent writer named William A. Blunden. Uh, very smart guy. This article about the deep state is, is what it's about, guys, is the shadow government. And he and he does let that term slip in one time, the shadow government, uh, which is what I call the deep state. And, and what, what this guy does is he lays it out. He lays it out in straightforward, well-organized, well-articulated, just what, how the planet works, how this combination of the banksters behind it all, the global banks, the global corporations, the global corporatocracy as I call it, led by the fossil fuel industry, the bankers and the fossil fuel industry in bed with the defense industry, the, the, this triple-headed snake, the war machine, as the artist taxi driver calls it, uh, the military-industrial complex, as Eisenhower warned us about 60 years ago. Uh, it, these guys are the, quote, shadow governments. They are the they. When, when you hear these conspiracy wackos talking about the word they, this mysterious they that people like to laugh about, these are they. These guys are they. And, you know, people just, they don't want to hear this. And so who they're talking about is what a lot of people, I use the term global corporatocracy, some people would use the term new world order, although here they had the day after Columbus Day, there's nothing new about it. 
is the same goddamn order that was run in this planet back in 1492. It's just that there's ten times as many people on the planet uh, involved in, 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 in this now. It's the same old story. It, it goes a lot deeper uh, than 1492, but well, what was good for 1492, you better damn well believe, is true for 2015. And this article was actually written a year ago, so it was written, uh, when was it? In August of, uh, no, September 1st, 2014. But don't, don't let that stop you from reading it, because you better damn well believe that uh, pretty much everything in this article is a hell of a lot truer now than it was a year ago. I wish that I had found this article when it first came out. So what I would recommend this article now, if, if you're watching Humpty Dumpty Tribe, if you are this deep into YouTube, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of new information for you guys. I don't want to insult your intelligence by this, by, by any means. But I still highly recommend you read it because it frames the, the whole conspiracy wacko argument into perfectly sensible language. So you, can, you, can, you might actually be able to slip this by some of your friends. If you, if you do have, if by any small chance you have a friend who does have a brain but if they hear the terms New World Order or conspiracy theories or the shadow government or whatever and they run screaming uh, from the room while, like the damn theater is on fire, this might be a way just to, just to, I don't know, plant a little seed. So anyway, I'm going to put the link to this excellent story from, uh, from this guy, and I suggest that you shut me up right now and just go read it yourself. But if you want to sit around and uh, li listen to some dumb hippie uh, sitting in his living room, uh, I will be glad to pick and choose. Now, th this is a, you really need to set aside like 30 or 40 minutes of quality time to read this uh, for yourself. So I'm just going to be able to touch on a little bit of it, but read it for yourself and send the link to anybody with, with the tiniest bit of interest and what I think is, you know, I, I just think, you know, I, I think the fact that, that a few people on this planet own this planet, I just think it's interesting. But anyway, uh, I'm going to dive into why the deep state, otherwise known as the shadow government, always wins the zero-sum game of perpetual war and he takes a little bit of time getting into it but anyway let's pick up right here ruthless men like Genghis Khan did not vanish into history books oh no they are still around some of them are right here in the good old USA it's just that they the, the they, the Genghis Khans, the modern day Genghis Khans, have replaced scepters with hand tailored suits and have traded thrones for seats on corporate boards. Such men often go unnoticed because they tend to exercise their power discreetly standing behind a veil of propaganda. For instance, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Steve Cole has called ExxonMobil an invisible company thanks to its disciplined and well-funded PR division. This underscores 
the fact that the narratives put forth by the press, meaning the mainstream media, are under the influence of an extensive subversion apparatus that CIA officer Frank Wisner referred to as the mighty Wurlitzer. Powerful groups build consensus behind closed doors. Okay, here we go. Can you say the builder burgers? Can you say the Council on Foreign Relations? Can you say the Trilateral Commission? Can you say Bohemian Grove? Just don't say these, do not say the word Bilderbergers. You know this guy does not say those words because he understands when people hear those words, they shut down and don't read any further. Make no mistake who he's talking about here. Powerful groups build consensus behind closed doors and then, as Chomsky and Herman explain, coax the rest of society along by manufacturing consent. Manufacturing consent, the name of Noam Chomsky's most famous book, thus enabling what is known as democratic elitism, the oxymoron democratic elitism. I love it. Despite all the filtering that occurs, readers will still occasionally get a glimpse of politicians dutifully lining up to kiss the boots of the plutocrats, meaning the guys behind the curtain who are really running the show. Political leaders like Barack Obama and George W. Bush are merely the hired help. Do you get it? And uh, of course Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush they are useful lightning rods who draw our attention away from the men working the levers of power in Washington, D.C. And, and everywhere else on the planet. Pluralists contend, uh, pluralists, yeah, uh, clueless morons contend that we, the voters, own these levers. Uh, I'm having this rant while uh, Hillary, while, while the Democratic uh, candidates are debating. Uh, clueless morons contend that we, the voters, own the levers. Published research says otherwise. So who are those guys? So, just who are the deciders? American philosopher John Dewey answered this question in one crisp sentence. Quote, politics, read these debates going on right now, <coughs> is the shadow cast on society by big business the global corporatocracy with the banksters behind them. And a number of sociologists have arrived at the same basic conclusion. For example, way back in the 1950s, a Columbia professor named C. Wright Mills described national policy decisions as being forged by a small group of what he called power elite who were bound together by shared class interests. And uh, then they break this down with some, with some other examples. And, and a natural corollary of this is that lawmakers, lawmakers respond to those groups which are capable of rewarding and punishing them. 
Yes, and then he looks into this fellow Thomas Ferguson and the investment theory of party competition. Ferguson's theory describes the political process as being dominated by corporate interests which coalesce into factions and compete to guide policy. And quoting Ferguson, analysis indicates that economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on U.S. government policy while average citizens and mass-based interest groups have little or no independent influence. Okay, let us take a look at some of these corporate sets and take a wild guess where he starts that would be the corporate emperors, the banks, the banksters behind it all. And he starts off by quoting Michael Rupert, once stated that, quote, the CIA is Wall Street and Wall Street is the CIA. And uh, so he talks about that for a while, talks about some of these multi-billion dollar fines, uh, okay, for, for those of you who do not understand this and are looking for a way to explain it to your friends just starting down this rabbit hole, which I started now, good God, almost seven years ago, large financial institutions maintain a special position in the power structure because they are the primary architects of the West, now the globe's, uh, economic model driven by an ideological vision of open markets and accessible resources. And now we'll have to say inaccessible resources. As custodians of the world's reserve currency, they work diligently to realize this vision. Bankers have demonstrated their ability to shape history and spur military engagement. When push comes to shove, as we saw in 2008, they can hold entire economies hostage. They, they, they hold the entire global economy hostage. This is not necessarily surprising given the amount of assets they have at their disposal. And I uh, break that down. Okay. Corporate emperors, other sectors. <clears throat> Number two on the list, right after the banksters behind it all, take a wild guess who the next one on the list is. Rivaling the banks are the fossil fuel companies. For example, oil monolith ExxonMobil, a corporate descendant of John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil, brings in annual revenue on the order of half a trillion dollars, thus making ExxonMobil roughly as big as the economy of Poland. I'm surprised it's not uh, bigger than that. And over the past two decades, Exxon has spent more than $200 million lobbying DC lawmakers. Modern society runs on oil, and this translates into a mountain of money and a comparable level of influence. Like the bankers, the executives of the fossil fuel industry have the resources to reward those politicians who attend to their needs. And this is why, guys, I have no hope in, in those absolute joke climate talks at the UN. 
Do you get it? The United Nations are complete, total pawns of these guys. The United Nations and, and, and every member country of the United Nations is, is owned by the very industry that is taking down the planet. Now, I'm not saying that the IPCC, the, the climate scientists, writing these reports are full of shit. Okay? I'm saying there, there's no way in hell that, that it, 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 despite what these climate uh, reports say, there's no way in hell uh, th these guys are, are, are a bunch of, they're a bunch of goddamn planet eaters. Pull your head out of your ass, people! Excuse me, let me get back to the story. Then I like how he says, finally, finally, yeah. Uh, well, skipping ahead in the list, good God, on uh, beyond big agriculture, big pharma, uh, on and on, he, he doesn't, even, doesn't even have time to get there. He goes from the banksters to the fossil fuel industry, uh, fossil fuel industry to guess who? Finally, there is the defense industry and its high-tech offshoots. This is a sector of the economy that has held sway since the end of World War II, when Charles Wilson, then president of General Electric, promoted the idea of a, quote, permanent war economy. Not only does the defense industry arm and equip the most powerful military on the planet, whose budget for 2014 is over $500 billion, but it also dominates the international arms market. In 2012, the New York Times reported that the United States weapons exports were more than 75% of the global market. Defense companies in the United States sell heaven, heavy weaponry to repressive governments in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Israel, and on and on and on. Business is thriving enough so that taken in aggregate defense contractors like Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Raytheon form a prevalent lobbying force in Washington. Yeah, you think so. Think of it this way. These are businesses. The defense contractors in bed with the fossil fuel companies and the banksters behind it all are businesses that manufacture the weapons which can level cities. Defense companies are intimately connected to people who wield such weapons both in the government and in the mercenary outfits of the private sector. The defense industry embodies the primeval archetype of unencumbered raw violence, the tip of the imperial spear, the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about as he left office. No one, no one, including Bernie Sanders, as, uh, as Chris Hedges was talking about last week, uh, I was explaining last week, no one, including Bernie Sanders, crosses these executives, not even those allegedly progressive political candidates who promise change. And don't get me wrong, guys, I'm voting for Bernie Sanders, but as Chris Hedges was pointing out, that there's no way you, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's why they always win. Okay, then he finally gets, so this is all leading up to his story about the deep state, what I call the shadow government, and he calls the elite's back door. So how is it that influential corporate factions with no constitutional authority whatsoever, well, I would question that, are able to exercise state power. Congressional staff member Mike Lofgren claims that the corporate elite 
go through a deep state an extension of the visible state that resides below the surface of the body politic. And uh, so he, he, looks, uh, he looks at all of this, the only time he uses the word shadow government, talking about Turkey, and, and he goes through several uh, other smaller examples leading up to the United States. Uh, like Turkey and Egypt, Ukraine also has a deep state, which the New York Times describes as being choreographed by a league of oligarchs. It is interesting that although the New York Times openly refers to oligarchs in Ukraine in its headlines, the editors are far more demure in terms of how they refer to the ruling class here in the United States. Okay, the American Deep State, or what Colonel Fletcher Prouty called the secret team, is a structural layer of political intermediaries, non-governmental organizations, lobbyists, media outlets, what he calls dark money pits, such as the NRA and that Koch brothers thing, uh, the dark money pits, and private sector contractors that interface with government organizations. This layer, this, uh, this, this layer of political intermediaries establishes a series of informal often secret back channels and revolving doors through which profound sources of wealth and power outside of government can purchase influence. Do you think so? And then they break down, uh, they dive in to all of the U.S. actions going on over there in the Middle East, this horse shit about uh, weapons of mass destruction. A uh, really good long quote, uh, which I don't have time uh, to get into. Okay, the defense industry thrives from regional conflicts, such as the one, all the ones in the Middle East a constant stream of flashpoints in America's self-perpetuating campaign to eradicate terrorism. And then they talk about uh, this war on terror, uh, you know, just going into the stratosphere. And the defense executives are not alone. The fossil fuel industry also extracts its pound of flesh. It, meaning the fossil fuel industry, is the failed state model for neo-colonialism. All right, let me try to let this guy explain this to you. Non-nuclear countries that have been ravaged by war are more susceptible to opening their doors and yielding nationalized resources on behalf of corporate pressure. Can they're talking about Iraq? I would say, can you say Sub Saharan Africa? And then, as perennial conflict abroad is leveraged as a tool of empire at home here in the U.S., it leads to repression. The late Chalmers Johnson, who studied this phenomena, characterized this with the adage, quote, either give up your empire or live under it. And then that leads into his talk, he dives into the NSA and Edward Snowden, and all of this, he quotes George Orwell from 1984, that uh, conspiracy wackos love to talk about. Jesus. 
American society cannot endure perpetual war and maintain a healthy middle class, especially when plutocrats and executives do everything in their power to avoid paying taxes. This is them with the IRS in their pocket. Hence the burden of supporting an endless series of bloody military campaigns falls on the rest of us. And so while the public eye is distracted with military shock and all, military shock and all overseas, the middle class here in the U.S. fails to grasp its own inevitable decline. Oh boy, a captive state strips away civil liberties, divest in social programs, blah blah blah, and resources that could be devoted to sustain the middle class are diverted into the extractive deep state, the planet eaters. Wrapping up this excellent rant, in 2006, journalist John Pilger spoke with Dwayne Claridge, a CIA officer who supervised agency operations in Latin America back in the 80s. Pilger asked Claridge as to what gave the CIA the right to overthrow foreign governments. Claridge responded, quote, like it or lump it, we will do what we like. So just get used to it, world, close quote. There you have it. When they want something, they take it. Native Americans here on the day after Columbus Day, Native Americans can attest to the veracity of this statement. This, dear readers, is the mindset of the ruling class, the true face of empire. There you go. Thank you very much. Hallelujah, brother Bill Bunden. An independent investigator, I bet he is. You think he's going to go to work for the New York Times any more than Chris Hedges? But anyway, guys, I need to wrap up this rant because I'm guiltily going to watch a little bit of that dog and pony show between Hillary and Bernie. But I have another rant, too, coming at you. But uh, I have to find my information elsewhere. I have no internet here. Uh, one more rant because like another conspiracy wacko rant, and if, and, and if one word of it is true, you don't have to worry about the shadow government when planet Nibiru comes to get you. But that will be another conspiracy wacko rant. For this one, Pass it on, guys. Pass the torch. Bye, guys.